WSRE presents Food for Thought, in-depth discussions of political, social, cultural, and scientific topics. In May of 2011, mixed-use development expert Rob Spanier spoke on the subject Beyond the Buildings. His presentation was recorded at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition in downtown Pensacola. Let's give Rob Spanier a warm Pensacola welcome. Thank you, Rob. Good evening, everyone. First, I do want to thank IHMC, uh, as well as all the sponsors, for having us down here. And when I say us, I say live, work, learn, play, because it could have been any one of us. And I also want to give a special thanks to uh, Chad and Brooke Henderson, who welcomed me into their home. I've had a lovely week spending time really getting to know your city. Uh, we love to get to know the places we get involved in. We do some teaching from time to time at, with various organizations. And when I spoke to Chad about nine months ago, he talked to me about this organization called IHMC. And I didn't know very much about it. But after learning more about it, I was, I was astounded. And your city and your community is, is a, a vibrant one. And it's one that's evolving and it's changing. And uh, it was my pleasure when I was asked to come down here and, and talk a little bit to you about a little bit about what we do and a little bit about some of our thoughts about how things are, are changing. And they really are changing. And I think the word change is an important one because there is an important movement that is, is happening throughout North America right now. And it's affecting us all. And it's not the economy. It, it's, it's the city. It's the place. It's the home. And really, what we do is we help. So a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, you may already know. You may have already heard it. I'm not here to tell you how to change your city. I'm not here to tell you what's wrong with your city. But I'm here to teach you, or hopefully impart upon, some lessons that I've learned in other places that may apply to Pensacola. And so a lot of the conversations that we have, and we, we look at it as more of a conversation than a presentation, uh, what we call Beyond the Buildings, because some of the greatest places in the world live on the street. And, and when you think about the towns and the cities and the communities that you visited, maybe your very own or other places, it's everything that happens beyond those buildings that really activates a place. And we have spent quite a fair bit of time helping communities, towns, and cities throughout North America to enrich these communities and places. We only work on five types of projects. And I thought I'd briefly just let you know about sort of who we are and what we do, because it, it really will set the context. But Live, Work, Learn, Play was born uh, under the ideas of helping to create strong mixed use urban environments. And we only do it in these places in downtowns and cities. We work on, and we're very involved in mixed use and new urbanism. And I'm, some of you may have heard Ray Gindro speak before. And we work closely with Urban Design Associates as well as many other firms. And we have such a deep respect and admiration for that entire movement and really enjoy being a part of it. We're very involved in healthcare. Uh, we're involved in college towns and universities. And of course, from my roots of working uh, in the resort industry, where I had the privilege and the pleasure of living in Destin, Florida, when we did the Village of Baytown Wharf. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. The only thing I will say about this part of the world is it's probably one of my favorites. Uh, I've had the fortunate opportunity to travel a lot. There's something very, very special in this community and in this area, and you're very fortunate. And it's hard to put your finger on it. Some people say it's the weather. Some people say it's the hospitality. I just think it's just it's the way of life and the people here uh, that make it so special. Um, if you want to know more about us, you can f please do take a look at our website. Uh, we have been involved in a number of projects as advisors, as implementation experts. And I'm going to talk to you a lot about implementation this evening. And as developers, uh, you know, from our previous lives and into today, we do these things. And, you know, there are projects down in this part of the world where we've been involved and places as far off as Europe. I thought I'd share some trends with you of what's really going on today. And, you know, the world population is growing. But what's so fascinating is 75% are living in urban areas or trying to get to these urban areas. And uh, living in a very big city of Toronto, up in Canada, I used to scratch my head saying, how's everybody going to move downtown? Impossible. 
And last week I was actually speaking at a conference in Toronto talking about the movement to the suburb suburbs and how there are new satellite downtowns that are emerging. And we're working on a bunch of those in, in Canada and in the United States. But people are seeking out urbanity. Downtown, it's the new in fashion word, it's en vogue. Everybody wants to talk about downtown. What's so special about downtown? 25, 30 years ago, everybody wanted to get out of downtown. Everybody wants to come back to downtown. What's happening? This integration between uses, mixed use, what is this idea of mixed use? What does that mean? Sprawl, urban sprawl, urban sprawl is bad. We want to get back to the core. Sustainability, all of you have heard about sustainability for the last 10 years, and we continue to talk about it. But the revival of these downtowns and main streets is becoming paramount. People are evolving in such a way, and communities are evolving, where they're seeking this urbanity. And future generations, if you start looking at the trends, you will see that the way in which we are living, in a healthier, more sustainable way, in a more walkable way, it's critical to start focusing on how to make these special places work, because it's not only a cool place to be, a hip place to be, it's a healthy way to live. Uh, I spoke in uh, for the Gates Foundation at the World Health Organization, talking about childhood obesity. And I'm sure a lot of you have read articles in the last couple of years about what a challenge we're facing in America and in Canada. Creating more urban compact places, allowing people to walk to the store as opposed to getting in the car to get a quart of milk, just makes sense. Gas prices are skyrocketing. How are we going to start thinking about the way in which we live and changing the way we live in our towns and cities? And apparently, and uh, very honored to be sharing the stage, Richard Florida has spoken to you here at, in this venue, and deep respect for Richard. Um, but talking about the idea of these, this, this innovation and organization of capitalism, density, the clustering of creative people, creative class, it's happening. In urban renewal, these neighborhoods with this mix of uses is what everybody's looking for. You know, it's fascinating about the college-educated population, I'm going to talk more about it later, is that there has been a major shift in the number of female graduates out of university. 25 years ago, 60% of the population was men, and 40% was women across North America. Yet, over 80% of the, that population, the women decided how the money was being spent in the family. Today, what do you think the statistics are looking like? 60% are women, 40% are men. They now have the money, still have that control, because they always will. <laughs> How are we planning places for women? You know, what's so refreshing in this audience to see is so many women here. And as you start to think about how your city is going to evolve, not only should you be thinking about women, women should be planning these places. It's critical. Um, oh, wow, there we go. <laughs> There you go. It's true. It's true. You know, funny story I'll tell you, when I was building resorts for a living about 12 years ago, we were talking about a project in Colorado, and we were talking about how to be very innovative and out there, and I was the young guy sitting at the table. I was about eight years old then, I'm older now. And we were all going around the table talking about what the big idea was and what it should be, and, and I remember one of the gentleman who was a very senior guy in the company said, I've got a big idea. We're going to be wireless. This is going to be a wireless resort. And I raised my hand and I said, if that's as, as good as we have it in 1999, we better close up shop. We need to be thinking so much further. Kids today, I have, a, I have an 11 month old daughter. She is typing on an iPad. <laughs> she, she understands and, and has, has the, this the sensation and understanding of how to work these things. How are we planning our downtowns for my daughter? Quick statistic for you. The United States has over 61,000 square miles of asphalt, roadway, parking lot. That is almost the same size as the entire state of Georgia. What have people been offered? Some of you can resonate with these images but what people really want is this. 
the number one thing that has come back to us within our organization and speaking to thousands of people in these communities and working with these communities is give us opportunities to connect. Allow us to connect to our families, to our children, to our grandchildren. Provide us opportunities to connect. Another interesting statistic for you, sense of community. Over 90% of new residential development over the last 25 years has been what you see to the left. All of you know, all of you have seen this. You know what this is. This is nothing new. But yet, through our research, over 76% of the United States market has this desire for a more urban fabric, a more mix of uses. And so I referenced the iPad. Uh, it would be the equivalent of Steve Jobs coming out with the ghetto blaster today and saying, this is what people want. Real estate developers have gotten away with murder, quite frankly because it's the only industry in the world where they were able to provide a product that didn't meet the need of the customer. And that is rapidly changing. And things have to change. We need to change with them, we need to embrace them, and understand how that benefits the greater community. I can tell you people are not retiring today the same way they did 20 years ago. They want to be involved, they want to be active, they don't want to be put out into a home on a highway to sort of waste away the rest of their lives. We need to be thinking about how to integrate that community, that important segment of the population, right into, it, right into the whole mix. And downtown is not for everyone. Let me be the first person to say that. It's not for everyone. But I will say a slice of urbanity is. Everybody wants to have that opportunity to connect. Single-use developments. Multi-use developments. Does anybody know what a multi-use development is? It is typically misunderstood as a mixed-use development because you have a bunch of different uses on one big parcel of land with parking separating it, and you say, oh, there's, there's your mixed use. That's not mixed use. That is a bunch of uses put together. The mixed-use ecosystem is wiring together all of these uses in one place. Residential over retail, office over retail, housing, parks, integrating this entire system, weaving it together. That's why downtowns fascinate me so much because thousands of years ago when these great European cities were created, they were created through this Roman camp town theory where all roads led to the center. How many people have you ever been to Europe? Raise your hands. Have you ever found when you've gone to Paris, London, or any other great European city how it's really easy to get in but really hard to get out? <laughs> There's a reason why they did it that way. And quite frankly, back then when they didn't have Starbucks and Publix, they had the, far, the market. They actually would centrally locate that market right at the heart so everybody could come and do their business in the heart of the community. So what is your mission, Pensacola? I bet that if I were to ask this question to many of you, I might get a different answer out of many of you. Is it about building this activated downtown that we're all hearing about and thinking about, that we're doing right now, quite frankly? There's a lot of great activity that's going on downtown. Is it about creating a great place to live? A vibrant waterfront. We want a vibrant waterfront. Is it about respecting and paying tribute to the historic character of our community. And I finally say our community because after spending the week here, and it's been several years since I've been back, I feel like I've been welcomed into this community so, you know, so, so beautifully and I want to thank you all for that. Creative commerce. Is it about small business growth? The mom and pop, the power of the mom and pop. Is it about community spirit? Is it about education? Comprehensive health care? Is it about tourism? Is it about the beach? Pensacola is all about the beach. It is a beautiful beach, though. <laughs> it is. Is it about a return on investment? Ego? <laughs> Here's a thought for you. It's about having a common vision and common goals. I think it's a little bit about everything. 
but we all need to be on the same page as to where we're heading or we're never going to get there. And it's about implementation and action. Getting stuff done. Enough studies, enough plans, enough pictures. Let's get it done. And let's get it done together. If I leave you with one message today, it's about the fact that there is so much happening in Pensacola today relative to other cities of your size. But everybody, you know, on Monday morning, they all go in their different directions. How do you get back together and figure out how to make it happen together, especially in your downtown? We have been involved in countless developments, cities, communities, and have really developed a process that is quite malleable to help communities implement on these visions. We act as advisors, as I mentioned to you. We are implementation specialists and, and deal-making specialists. And I'll talk to you about targeted leasing and casting, which is something that I have been doing for now 12 years, where we actually live in a community, become a part of that community, become part of that project to help bring that vision to fruition. We are development experts. And quite frankly, we have been asked to help fund and finance projects, or at least help find that funding and financing. And I've got to tell all of you, Money exists, it's out there. Look at what's going on in your community today. There's a lot of money out there. I contend that with the right plan, business plan and implementation strategy, you'll never have a challenge to figure out how to get the money, as long as it makes sense. But if it doesn't make sense, I'll be the first person to say, don't do it. Stop. There are many steps in the process, and we've tried to boil this down for you and I'm sure Ken will share this presentation uh, with, with uh, the speaker series, but not, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Some cities and some towns have already done a significant amount of work and are just trying to get over the hump. Some people have to go back to square one, but it's about getting through the steps that will allow you to get to that answer. You know, I, I had a really interesting conversation this morning, and if you don't, have, if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to get there? was a bit of the discussion that we had. And if you know where you're going and you understand the economics behind it, you can make it happen. Everybody wants to see action. We love to implement. We love to make these places happen. But if you don't have a very clear plan that everyone buys into with a shared vision, you're going to have a lot of trouble getting it done. So here, I'm going to walk you through some of the steps that we use uh, in our process on, on how we get to where, where we need to go. But building on a solid foundation. I got asked a great question in an interview for the radio uh, this afternoon about the history and the heritage and should we just leave it behind and move on? And I said, absolutely not. I said, you should never forget your roots. In any community, don't forget your roots. And some communities don't have as rich a history. They may have a challenged history challenged community. We've worked in some of the most challenged communities in America. But you need to understand where you came from if you want to head forward. And you need to work together. Leadership, civic, public, and private. Working together with change agents. Building a vision. Understanding the program that you're trying to go after based on understanding the people who are going to be sought after or, the, or what makes sense. You know, a lot of discussion happened on, about Palafox. I've driven Palafox, what would you say, Chad, 20 times? <laughs> Walked it probably 15 times. I think there's so many exciting things that can go on on Palafox and in many other parts of the city. But you need to have a vision and you need to have a program to get there. Understanding your end users, market supply versus demand. We're very focused on the demand who is coming to your downtown? Who are these people? How much time and money are they spending? What are they looking for when and where? It's lovely to say that you have all this vacant land and you have these buildings and we got lots of space and let's just bring someone down here. But who are you trying to cater to? What are you trying to accomplish? Not today, but over the next 10, 20 years. The greatest cities in the world, the ones that have endured, are constantly evolving but they're always going back to their roots and understanding how that, that plan, that grid worked. End users. 
We had a round of applause for the women, and I agree with it. Does anyone have a child between the age of zero and, and four in the room? Some may, some may not. I'm going to say I'm going to say there's lots of hands going up in the other room, maybe, <laughs> possibly. Grandchildren between the ages of zero and four. Great grandchildren. Great grandchildren. There we go. Perfect. You have a digi me. You have a digi me. That is a little person that actually types on some form of a keyboard before they know how to walk. I have proof in my own house. And the wonderful thing about technology is Skype, you can be anywhere and you can still be right there and it's incredible. Baby boomers, Zoomers and empty nesters, we all know who they are. Some of them are sitting in this room. What are they looking for? What are you looking for? How can we help understand what the community is all about? Teenagers and podsters. Podsters are children between the ages of 14 and somewhere between 20 and 22. They travel in packs. <laughs> they don't look at you when they talk to you anymore. They're doing some, typing on some form of mobile device. Bright, brilliant, aspiring, energetic. I remember this story came out in the city of Toronto where I lived where they built a new uh, roller skate park and it flooded. And it was one of these bowls and it flooded. And there was a newscast showing how the thing had flooded. And you had all these kids sort of skating around the pond. And they said, well, if they just asked us, we would have told them how to build a great skate park for free. <laughs> Millions of dollars, thousands of hours, consultants, advisors, who knows best? Youth. And I'll, I'll actually turn it to another coin. When you think about the boomers and the zoomers, you know, just trying to pretend to think what the next generation is looking for and how we're thinking about retirement and all other things. How come our, our city fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers aren't involved in these discussions to help shape it? Not to tell us what we don't like. Not to sit there and complain about what they're unhappy about. What can we do to affect change? How can we help? And one of the things that we do when it comes to the commercial or the mixed use, the retail, the restaurants, the services, the civic, the cultural, the entertainment is we actually think about, based on those people, those end users, how much commercial space should be built? You know, you have a lot of space downtown, but how much can be supportable? Can't all be the coffee shop. Can't all be the restaurant. Can't all be Jackson's. Can't be. Can be more, and I support that. But how much can be supportable and, and, quite frankly, what should be developed where and when? <coughs> Strategic action and implementation. It's about the business planning and the programming. They go hand in hand. You need both. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I'm so fond of, which is the implementation side. But you need that plan. If you don't have that real plan and that business plan, it's not, not just a drawing. It has to make economic sense. But targeted leasing and casting and community drivers and animations are a process that we have been doing now for many years. I've been doing it for 12 years. And it's the art and the science of specialty deal, deal making and everyday rituals. Why bother casting? Why should you do it? Why should you go out and try things differently? Just put a sign in the window and say for lease, let's hope people will show up because they're going to come, right? We've been studying something called the care quotient now for way too long. And what's fascinating is when you go through some of, the, uh, of our exercises, the amount of energy is directly proportionate to the outcome. <laughs> it's kind of science. It's like science. You know, when you have a street shop owner or a single building owner, what does he really care about? Gets the rent check. Don't break the windows. See you once a month. Maybe not. Move on. Little effort. Space gets leased. Fantastic. When you have a strip center, it's a little bit more of a thought that goes into it. You may have an anchor tenant, a tenant that sort of anchors the, for financing and sits at the corner. It's a bit bigger. When you have a shopping mall, there's a lot more thought that goes into it because there's all these additional costs and you have these internal walkways. And you really start thinking about the mix of those tenants. And when you get to the level of a hotel, you only have one or two retail opportunities and you really want to get that right tenant that fits your model. Although hotels are evolving today and there's not as much retail in them as there used to be. When you come to a downtown, you better care 100% as to who's going into your downtown. Or you're going to hear statements like, we're turning into Bourbon Street. 
I think I heard that somewhere. <laughs> Quite frankly, you need to care about all the tenants. I believe it's like a balanced portfolio. You need to have those incredibly vibrant restaurants and those bars and those clubs and those arts and theaters. You need them all. That's what makes a complete downtown. So I bet, my, 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 I will surmise, that if you had a little bit more of everything else, you may not notice having so many entertainment venues to, that you have today. Maybe. And our process has been quite simple. It's about understanding who is in the marketplace, relationship building. Understanding who these operators are. Actually running events and bringing these operators to understand more about what we're looking to accomplish within a project. Helping them to get through the process because a lot of our operators are these mom and pops that work in our projects. But helping them to understand how to get through the, the legal mumbo jumbo to be able to make these things happen. Business plans, what a novel concept. They want to open up a business but they don't need a business plan. We require business plans from all of our tenants that go into our projects and projects for people that we work for. <laughs> Detailed business plans. Are they credit worthy? Can they survive beyond the first six months? We go through the whole legal documentation process with them and we help them get through that lease process. We do this on the ground, just so you understand what I'm talking about. We live in communities. I lived in Destin. Have, how many of you have been to the village of Baytown Wharf, if any? Fair bit of you. Anyone ever been to Acme Oyster House? Ever gone to see the, the old grumpy old candy maker, Tom Elke? Yeah. I was the one who lived there and went and found the best of the best for the village of Baytown Wharf. We have been doing this for 12 years. Quite frankly, 17 years. But I wasn't, I wasn't with uh, my partner who had been doing it uh, before me. To go find those operators and put them together in one place. And I'm not here to talk about Sandestin, I'm not here to talk about resorts, but what I'm telling you, the work that we're doing today in many of the projects, we're doing the exact same thing with great success. But it's about understanding what's going to have the greatest impact on your downtown and how to focus your attention. Singles, uh, to use the baseball analogy, singles, doubles, and triples. Win the game. Some bunts. Grand slams, usually you strike out. Home runs, rarely. And it's about finding these unique commercial experiences and you have a lot of them in your downtown. How do you go find more and bring them together? We've been asking the same four questions, or at least I have for the last 12 years. Who are you? What is your concept? What is your experience running this business? And what is your financial capacity to be able to deliver for this town, for this community, for this project? Four simple questions. But it's about building those relationships because quite frankly, these are become your ambassadors within your community. You want your eyes on the street, you want to reduce crime, fill those vacant storefronts. Get people who take pride in Pensacola to open up businesses downtown. You'll be amazed at what can happen and the reduction of crime by having feet on the street. Incredible. And one of the other things that's really interesting is it's not just good enough to go out and find tenants through this elaborate process. It's you've got to make sure these people stay in business. And you need to drive traffic for them. You need to set up a proper process that drives daily, monthly, weekly, annual <coughs> events and festivities to get people to come and spend money in these businesses. Don't just be proud of Jackson's. Go spend some money there. Don't be proud about telling your, telling your friends that this new restaurant called Elise went there. Go spend money there. That's how they survive. That's how businesses thrive, through support of the community. And quite frankly, when the locals support it, guess who's going to come and want to see it? Everybody else, that's right. Everybody else is going to want to be there. They want to go where the locals hang out. That's the only question I ask when I travel. Don't send me to where the tourists go. Where do the real people hang out? Send me there. These events and festivities need to happen. You need to have that happen through your leadership in the city. Get involved. Be a part of this, this environment. As an operator, if you're a business operator and you're operating in the downtown, open your doors and 
asked to make some of these events happen right within your own spaces or outside of your spaces. It's phenomenal. Some of the other things that we do in projects is in, in projects where we're trying to get them off the ground or establishing other ideas, carts and kiosk programs. The little hot dog vendor is a thing of the past. The most innovative things I have seen. You see this uh, little box? This sits in Montreal, about, I don't know, a two minute walk from my office in Montreal. It's an old shipping container that has been retrofitted and they serve lobster sandwiches from the Magdalen Islands. It opens up, it's solar powered, it creates a little patio. It absolutely activates a space. And guess what, at nighttime, it locks itself back up like a shipping container. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Anyone been to Santa Cruz, California? They have an incredible cart and kiosk program there. It lines the streets, it's beautiful. But true community ownership doesn't just happen in events and festivities and carts and kiosks and great retailers. It's about supporting them, really truly supporting them. And that's something that I think that we need, all need to do a better job of, of making sure that we continue to support one another. But the return on investment for a downtown by doing these things, what's amazing is, is it can stimulate new job growth increased residential and pent up demand for residential. Assets will perform effectively. Landowners that have owned land in the downtown that have wanted to do things for years are going to are going to get to start doing things. Those that own land that haven't done things for years got to start thinking about what they need to be doing and how they need to be doing something. Because quite frankly, you have real opportunities in your downtown and you need to start activating those opportunities. And offices, it's amazing. This culture today, people who graduate from university, they decide where they want to live first, and then they'll figure out the job. So, you know, IHMC's business is helped by having a greater downtown. Maritime Park will be helped by having a greater downtown. The city as a whole will be helped by having a greater downtown. The effects will reverberate throughout your community. So I'm going to talk to you very quickly about a couple of case studies, projects we are working on, have worked on in the past. Habersham, South Carolina, some of you may know of it. It's just outside of Beaufort. It's a very well known and respected new urbanist development. Bob Turner, an incredible developer in, in new urbanism and a real pioneer for the movement. And Rowan Boulevard, where I'm sure none of you have ever heard of this project because it's uh, 20 minutes outside of Philadelphia. Rowan University you may have heard of, but Rowan Boulevard is, is a new project that's just getting off, uh, off the ground. But Habersham was an incredible project, an incredible new urbanist project, and a beautiful town center that quite frankly was vacant. It was like going to a movie set. Beautiful, but didn't exist. And it was outside of Beaufort. And some of the challenges of, of these new urbanist developments is that they don't have that downtown plugged and played, ready to go. And it's very challenging because these people buy into a vision of they're going to have their downtown. And when you can't even get a cup of coffee in the morning, it's a bit of a challenge. So we inherited a project with a bit of an obscure location. If any of you have been there, it's interesting. Lack of critical mass. They had sold all of the units in the downtown core as the live work model. I am a firm supporter of live work units, not in the downtown core because the woman who decided to buy a unit uh, and told her husband, I'm going to sell antiques. I love antiques. I'll sell antiques downstairs. It'll be great. You can't be open from 2 to 2.15 on Thursdays. <laughs> Doesn't work. It does not work. Two-third vacancy and some bankruptcies. Their lease structure was really not organized. We had to help them with that. The governance and ownership uh, was challenged. Lack of these events and festivities that we talk about. The public realm really wasn't being utilized. The operators in there were not doing well, not for their own fault, but some of them shouldn't have been there in the first place, and, and some of them were just not being supported because there was not enough traffic there. And a lot of the businesses did not reinforce the vision of what they were trying to accomplish at Habersham. What did we do 
action. We very quickly assessed the scenario and the situation. We turned around the business plan. Our greatest challenge was having a meeting with the 26 live work owners. And I didn't realize that that was probably the most important meeting we had when I went to present this idea to these live work owners because quite frankly, if these people did not buy into this idea, there could never be a downtown because they were under the firm belief that a broker would come and lease their 650 square foot space by itself in the middle of nowhere with nothing else going on. And I can tell you, though I'm not a broker, it will never happen. So thankfully they all got on board because we showed them an economic model that made sense for them as owners. We showed them a rent structure that we were going to achieve. We showed them a strategy that we were going to employ. And quite frankly, Bob Turner stood up and said, I'm getting these guys involved and, and, and putting my money where my mouth is to make this happen. 13 new businesses open for business. We helped them set up their community drivers and animations program and at the beginning we had no money. So Ryan Bloom, our vice president of targeted leasing and casting, our vice president of implementation, Ryan liked basketball. Ryan started playing basketball on Thursdays, three on three basketball, starting to attract a bit of a crowd. Ryan set up the Harvest Festival by getting sponsors and donors from the community and started to create what was known as the annual Harvest Fest, bringing all of the purveyors of fruits and vegetables and activities and we had a, a tent and we had music and we had created this entire festival around the harvest. I think we had several thousand people that didn't even know Habersham existed right in their own community that attended that night. Tenants were thrilled, but it can't be once a year. Yoga by the lake, by the water, the running club, uh, working outdoors, working out, the dog run, all kinds of small little, little things that are really very basic that get people downtown and spend a couple dollars. Incredible. We drove over 40 events, festivities, and everyday rituals. These are real pictures that I actually took from Harvest Fest while I was there. Incredible. Nothing makes me prouder. We started the regional market. We've opened up five uh, farmers markets across the United States over the last 18 months. Really not very complicated. You have a farmers market. How do we make it better? How do we make it more utilized? How do we do that? We help them improve on their existing assets. And these are before and after pictures that I took, which was fascinating. And it's, it's easy to say, well, you put a couple tents up and you make it happen. We put tenants in business, open for business. We, we helped Bob make good on his promise to create the town center that associated with the residential development. We also helped him across the street with his future plan uh, for his future residential. When the market comes back, he's going to continue that development. We helped him on that whole approvals process and quite frankly on the mixed use core, we helped him program those uses so that they can complement what he has and not compete with it and continue the story. Iconic and enduring legacy of the town of Habersham. I can tell you that it's not perfect, but it's a lot better. And we constantly are, we are honored to have been involved with Bob. We have a wonderful relationship with him and we handed him off the baton after we were done. And he continues. He continues to perpetuate the legacy of implementation on the core. So it was a real true success story through targeted leasing and casting and, and community drivers and animations. And this is nothing new. It's just a different way of looking at things. Lots of great things came out of this. We're very proud of it and quite frankly we view this as a shared success because it would never have happened had we not had the collaborative efforts of the developer. Rowan Boulevard. Anyone been to Glassboro, New Jersey before? I have. Oh wow, we have somebody. Okay. So you know about Glassboro, New Jersey. Small town, 20,000 people living in the town, but 1.3 million residents within a 30 minute drive. It's a very dense environment, you know, the northeast part of that northeast near Philadelphia. Not much going on by way of town, downtown, really dilapidated downtown. <sighs> Rowan University is in the town, just on the other side of this parcel of land that we are helping to develop and supporting the developer there. Uh, over 11,000 students, faculty and staff, 
They have their own land. A little bit closer to the town than what you're used to, but they have their own land. And what we realized there, and probably the biggest message of this discussion is, cannot do it alone, especially in this city. We need to have all of these in people who are invested and have a vested interest in this downtown to make it happen. We need to rally the troops. Because the downtown was failing, and they had this parcel of land that they had uh, RFP'd off, request for a proposal to find a developer. You may have heard of that process in this town, too to come and bring to life this downtown. Well, this developer was doing a great job, but they were getting a bit off track because they were focusing on some of the more mainstream tenancies. And the city and the town really wanted to see that local regional flavor. They didn't want more of the national big box, not more of the same. But at the same time, they were concerned about their own downtown because it was failing. And it had to be a unified effort to try to fix all of these things. And we said, we're going to take it one step further. We need to get your university involved in your downtown. It is the future lifeblood of your community. I know they're right next door. Let's get them right in. So the vision for Rowan Boulevard that was created was this mixed-use main street connecting Rowan University to Glassboro's historic downtown, serving the community. But we had to make it a place for students and local residents. It has to be their own. They need to own this place. And this is really, this is the map. This is this development that is underway. And your downtown abuts this development. They've already built out two student residence buildings. Uh, they have their Barnes & Noble bookstore anchored. They're, we're finalizing the plans and the details for uh, first two blocks of their main street. And they have their hotel underway. But we, again, we said, wait, wait, wait. Let's talk to the university. And what does the university need with a downtown plan? They have their land. They can build on their own land. They can do whatever they want. But we said we are adamant. We need to get them to this table. We need to get them involved. Why? Because every great downtown incorporates, involves that, that university. Ponder this thought for a moment. How do we get the university downtown a little more? How do we really get them downtown? How do we have students downtown? Not just visiting. How do we do it? $300 million public-private partnership, 26-acre development, uh, 1,400 beds planned, 40,000 square feet of office space, 200,000 square feet of mixed-use retail, restaurant, services, and the hotel. We are doing targeted leasing and casting today. We have someone on the ground there, has been there for five months. We will be having our first VIP events where we invite these best of the best to come and, try, quite frankly, compete for their opportunity to be a part of this downtown this June. And we will continue doing these things as we move things forward with the tenancy. So here are some of the uses that you're going to see in Glassboro. So what have we achieved there? And we're not done. We've got a long way to go. <coughs> we brought together the university, the borough, and the developer. And if you call the borough of, please call Joe Briganti. Phenomenal. Phenomenal steward of his community, doing everything in his power. I remember sitting in a meeting with the city and the developer, and you couldn't tell who was who. It's one of the best public-private partnerships I've ever seen, because everybody realizes that the vested interest is the long-term success of this development. But the greatest thing that we did was continuing education is going to be taking 60,000 square feet on floor two, three, and four of one of the buildings downtown. Now, why do you ask? Is that such a great thing? because it is in line with the goals of trends of where the population is going. And quite frankly, it gets the university involved in this, in this downtown. They are here. They can go build a building on all their 200 acres, but they realize the value of being downtown. <coughs> it's an economic activator. It's a financial way of getting a project going. But most importantly, it reinforces the point of this great mixed use environment. <coughs> So what are some of the key ingredients that we have gleaned over time in these projects, in these places, that I thought I would sort of leave you off with? The physical side of things, activate your streets. Activate them well. Let people spill out patios, terraces. I know it's hot. I get it. How do we figure out how to deal with that heat 
on some of those months. And I, and I don't have that answer for you today. I'm not here with all the answers. But quite frankly, get people out, get people in. Mobility. If the university says, I'm never coming downtown, it's never going to happen. How do we connect them to the downtown? Actively connect them. Make sure that they, this is their hangout on all other times when they're not at school. I drove that campus. It's beautiful. It's very remote. <laughs> and I can tell you that our studies show that when students decide where they want to go to university for four years, place plays a huge factor in it. Do I want to go to UWF if, I'm, if I can afford the opportunity or if I've earned the opportunity? Or do I want to go to Boston? I don't know. You tell me. Strong anchors, civic anchors, all types of anchors. I don't view a Home Depot or a Walmart as an anchor. <laughs> that is not an anchor. That is an economic model and, a, quite frankly, a piece of real estate that over time will serve its purpose and be gone and proves itself that way. It's a wonderful service, though. And some people have used it and continue to use it, and, not, and I even use it. I, I understand it. There's a, the right place for everything. It's definitely not in your downtown. But get these real places. I spent the majority of my week in these real places, incredible places, places that you feel right at home in. Get more of those. <coughs> Place, social eateries. It's a movement that is happening across North America. You know where it is because it's in your downtown. Keep going with it. Create gathering spots for people, not large gathering spots. Not, don't build the church for Easter Sunday. Small little spaces where you can connect. Squares, trail systems, connections. Regional flavor, continue that. It is my favorite part about this part of the world. Your flavor is incredible. Flavor of, t of food, of people, culture, community. Embrace it and share it. And arts and culture. It's a, an important anchor within these communities. And you have some great stuff going on. Activation. Events and festivities, events and festivities, events and festivities. Not just the July the 4th parade. Every day. Learning, lifelong learning. Commerce, business, people, and where kids can be kids. And quite frankly, not just the little ones. You're all kids. We're all kids. How do you have fun? Somewhere along the lines, real estate developers forgot what it was like to have fun. Let's get back to that. So it's not one thing. It's all of these things together that make these special places. So some final thoughts for consideration to ponder. I thought I'd leave you off with Sandestin because I wasn't allowed not to tell you a little bit about some of those successes. Your town is not a resort. Let me be for the first to tell you, I don't want it to be a resort. It shouldn't be a resort. It should be a town. But I'll tell you, if I could have every tenant from Sandest in the village of Baytown Wharf in your downtown, those operators, I'd be really happy. I wish my friend Ron Green would come and consider coming downtown from another broken egg. He is phenomenal. He is best in class. There's others. Lot, all of them, actually. But the vision of Sandestin was to create a four-season, pedestrian-friendly, mixed-use coastal village in a highly competitive marketplace. All of you know what was going on when this was being developed. There was more national retail and big box and lifestyle going on in that part of Destin when I lived there than I, we knew what to do with. Not to mention the Silver Sands was the most successful outlet mall in definitely the southeast, if not North America, at the time. What was our challenge? We were on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> Where's the ocean, I said when I got here. I said, let me show you. We used to call it the bog before because there were these massive mosquitoes that were flying around before we cleared the dirt. But we had all this competition. We had these lovely things called security gates. We had parking issues. We had a whole bunch of issues, lots of challenges. Our strategy, if we try to compete with what's out there, we will not succeed. Let's be different. Surprise, surprise. 
What do we love so much about this culture and this community? Some of the local regional flavors, the grab and go treats. We were going to activate this place like no other. But the interesting thing that we did is we said we're going to target the locals. We're going to make this the locals hangout first. Because we weren't going to have that population mass there and ready to go at the beginning. But we knew that if we got the locals first, everyone else would follow. And they did. <laughs> and now some people feel like they don't, it's not a locals place anymore. But at the beginning it was. Results, the only reason I'm sharing these results with you is to show you the art of the possible. We pre-leased all of the commercial spaces to these operators 10 months prior to the village opening. I remember having to go rework the whole economic model because we, we went too far, too fast. Oops, let's figure it out. Sales per square foot, we're doing very well. 90% of the tenants rent a percentage rent in their first year after opening in the village. And, and that's just an economic discussion of how you get tenants in. It's not about getting the most amount of rent out of the gates from a tenant. It's about making sure that they can succeed and survive and sharing in their success with them. So there's a term called percentage rent that allows you to do that and sharing their success. Local mom and pop operators understand what that is. We had incredible results. What's fascinating is our sales on the residential side, because Intro West was a residential developer, we sold condos. We were selling condos at $400 per square foot on in the village side, whereas we were having about $185 to $200 a foot in success on the beach side. How can this be? Why do people want to be in the village? It was, it was really a success for us at the time. There was a lot of profit that was made on that village. There's a lot of things I would have done differently. Learn a lot over time. And we've made thousands of mistakes. And we've learned from those mistakes. So a lot of the times when we take people on tours of projects we were involved with previously or stuff that we're, even we're doing now, we'll, we'll take them on the mistake tour. See that? See that? I would never have done that again. Wow, were we stupid. What were we thinking? If you can't point a finger at yourself, you know, shouldn't be in this business. But nothing makes me prouder because it is what it is and it continues to be and I only hope that the new owners of Sandestin continue to hold on that theory and that vision and continue to support those operators because they are a major driver of that community. There's a lot of golf in, in southern Florida and northern Florida. Back to basics, enduring and iconic. You guys get this in your community. It's all about the simple pleasures. We've been studying this bakery. I've been studying this bakery for 12 years. This is a small bakery in the town of Annecy in France. Anyone ever been there? Fantastic. Little known fact, this bakery has been in the same location for hundreds of years in some shape or form. Anyone want to know what's next to the bakery? Anyone? Coffee shop. Next to the <laughs> Logic. Why would you need a coffee next to the bakery? There's a butcher close by flower shop. There's a bar. Over the bar, there's the hotel or the inn. Off the square, where everybody used to come and do their shopping. Uses have changed and evolved in Annecy, but the right programming and the right mix of the right uses lasts forever. And these guys are really smart. I'll tell you why. You see that? That's a vent. And they pipe the smell of that bread <laughs> into the walkway, and it's incredible. And, you, and I took this picture. And you see people, the door's wide open. Very simple facade, a glass pane showing, their, showing off what they have to offer. But it's just back to basic, simple, and excellent. And you have a lot of those operators today in your community. Continue to do this. Can Pensacola pull and move in the same direction? Leverage your existing assets. Leverage them. Embrace them and leverage them. Knitting the parts together. I said this earlier on in my discussion. There are so many great things going on in Pensacola. How do you start figuring out how to make sure that they all happen, but collectively and understanding what one person is doing and the other person is doing. And quite frankly, don't have one conversation and go and have a different conversation. We all need to get on the same page. There's a lot of great stuff going on here. 
Incredible stuff. But the, if I leave you with one message, it's not your buildings, it's not your park, it's not your beach. Your only truly sustainable asset is your people. Figure out what they want, figure out how to keep them coming back, figure out how to keep this room coming downtown. I hope you all leave this room and go for dinner downtown tonight. All of you. All of you go. Go together. <laughs> Imagine what would happen at Jackson's. They wouldn't know what to do. It'd be fantastic. But make that a ritual. Make that an IHMC ritual that every time you come to one of these talks, you go have dinner downtown. It'd be a wonderful ritual. It seems to me that the development you describe near Sandestin might be very, very different in terms of the issues that we're facing here. I'm just wondering if you were to look at our downtown and what exists now, uh, and I can see the university needing to be down here, but what are some of the, the real common sense kinds of things that we can do now uh, to, to make the downtown thrive? Rockford, Illinois, where we have done significant work there, uh, it's one of the worst cities in America today, economically. It's challenged. And quite frankly, w helping to turn around that downtown is not very different than any, any other town. Um, I think my point, if I were to think about what I would do, I think it would be some of the more simple things. You know, I, got asked, I got asked this very similar question over lunch today about what would you do if you were mayor? <laughs> what would you tell the mayor to do? And I think it's about coming up with three to five very simple things that you want to accomplish. And I think you have some major advantages as being a real downtown, per se. It's not a new project. It's a historic downtown. But figure out what those three to five things are that you're going to do. I think driving more traffic downtown is great, but you need to give them more things to do. I think there's a real issue of a residential issue downtown where clearly the, the, you know, the studies are showing so I've been told, that people want to live down here. But there's an economic challenge about doing that because whenever product comes on, it's too expensive. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to deal with that? And that has to come from the city. You're going to have to figure out some of the economic policy that's going to deal and allow for that. So I think, that, I think some of those challenges need to be faced quite head on. Where some of the simple things, like uh, sending 260 people to go downtown to Jackson's, or Elise, <laughs> I'm, gonna, you know, I'm not going to offend anyone, any of the restaurants downtown for that matter, need to happen um, on a more frequent basis. So what can we do? Our town, it's not new, it's, it's challenged. I think that you need some more activity happening, but I think you need a plan, quite frankly, one cohesive plan, one plan and one vision that everyone buys into that can be implemented.